Hello. So um, we have our most of our board for Lama and Alpaca Information Day, which is a 401c3 nonprofit in the state of Washington. Um, we are a group that offers purely education. That's our only interest. We're not here to sell or promote them for anything else. And quite frankly, often people, after they hear what we present, they say, you know what? I had no idea they took that much care. Maybe I don't want them, which is fine. That means I don't have to rescue them down the road. So um, this is our treasure. Our vice president's not here. And both of these ladies are board members. So everybody that's involved with this donates their time. So we host this day every year. Um, we provide a variety of educational classes. They're all free of charge. They're on everything from shearing llamas to a vet that comes and talks about basic care and expectations for that to um, someone that comes and talks about how to manage your property, which is our conservation district. We've had a working relationship with them for years, um, and it's been fabulous because not only do you need to know how to take care of your animals, but if you don't maintain your property, it's pretty hard to take proper care of your animals. So um, the goal is to provide education and the tools to make good choices and make sure that this is something you want to do and know where to get what you need to properly do it. Um, everyone that helps with that day assists free of charge with the same goal of providing education and not peddling llamas or alpacas. Um, and as I said, Watson Conservation District has been a big partner of ours in that day. So 2023 will be our 13th annual llama and alpaca education day. Oh. And this year it's in Kelso, Washington. And it, we can get you information on that. If you want to come, you need to give us your information. You can sign up. There's a sign up sheet in our booth. And we also have business cards and a flyer you can take. So that's kind of a variety of our classes to give you an idea of everything from our vet speaker to pack discussions to people teaching you how to halter them and how to catch them. So everybody always wants to know what kind of care and do llamas and alpacas require? They need shelter. You can't just leave them out in a field. Uh, they need a three-sided shelter, a barn, a shed, or some sort of protection from the weather. Um, some of us actually even blanket them. Um, fencing. So it's not always about keeping them in, it's keeping things out. Um, llamas are animals that get eaten by other animals. A cougar, a full-size cougar, will eat a llama. Um, dogs, overzealous, aggressive dogs will take out a llama. So you want to have really good fencing for llamas or alpacas. They need access to clean water and unlimited access at all times. Um, they need second to third cutting hay. And honestly, most of them do not do well on hay that is here locally. We get ours from Eastern Washington. Most of the time, it doesn't have enough protein over here to sustain their needs, especially if they're having babies or they're active packing or driving. Um, we also have had in the last few years a problem with nitrate poisoning. Um, a lot of the hay here, depending on when it's cut, can have high nitrates and that will kill a llama. Pam lost one of her llamas a couple years ago to nitrate poisoning. Had no idea until we started having all these people have problems with it. So we all test our hay and we're careful where we get from. Um, what you feed and how much depends on what you're doing with them. Animals that are actively driving, packing, um, and doing things, or like nursing mothers, they need extra feed. So we spend, like, I'm, I think, almost, well, you do a little bit of breeding, but I'm probably the one that breeds the most. And I have to very carefully feed my animals, and they're in different groups depending on their age and how much, um, how, how big their babies are and how much they're nursing. So, um, and they eat about a flake to two a day plus grain, depending on if, the, if they're healthy and they're young and they're not doing anything real active, they're probably just gonna have grass hay. Um, we also feed a mineral mix that's formulated for llamas and alpacas. And as I said, grain is fed to pregnant, thinner, older animals. Um, care, they have to be wormed just like goats, sheep, anything, um, they get parasite loads and it depends on what kind of stress you're putting them on. Um, the more that you populate in an area, the higher your parasite loads generally. So that's where the conservation district can be a good, good helping hand because you'll learn how to manage things properly so you're not overpopulating your property. 
Um, we run fecal reports generally to see where their parasite loads are at because just giving them warmers is like you taking cough syrup if you might get a cold. So you need to know what you're treating or you're, you're just worming for no reason. Uh, and they require yearly vaccinations, treatment to prevent lice because we do get moist. They get skin and fungal issues. Toenail trimming monthly. Grooming, which includes brushing, shearing, or extensive brushing for packers by raking. So three of the llamas we here have here today are packer style llamas. They have an undercoat that rakes out like a Labrador retriever. So we rake them out, but if we weren't gonna do that, they need to be sheared. Any llamas are all packers you see out in the county, they're not sheared. That's like a dog that's tied out in the yard without having grooming done. It's not fair to them and they get very hot. When we had that heat spell two summers ago, there was a whole bunch of dead alpacas and llamas that weren't sheared. Older llamas need teeth floats like horses. They also need blankets and lots of extra grain. So if you buy animals that are getting older, you're essentially inheriting other people's vet bills. So you have to know that. Some people choose to do that, but you wanna be careful and go into it knowing that just because you're getting a free llama doesn't mean it's a free llama. <laughs> yeah. Young males have fighting teeth that need to be removed and they need to be kept separate from females. Um, you also don't want to keep geldings in with females because they still breed them and they can cause damage to their reproductive system. Um, older animals need straw and blankets and things to be, I have a whole herd of llamas that all but two are wearing blankets. It's cold where we live and they have to have that extra warmth. So, um, animals that are left out in a pasture People think you can just throw them out. First of all, they're browsers. They're not going to eat your pasture down unless you overpopulate them and put a bunch of them in a small area. And then you're going to have parasite problems and you're going to have other issues. So it's super important to control their, their caloric intake, especially if you want to pack or do active things. Um, good nutrition is good if you want them to hold up and, and live a long, healthy life. Pasture maintenance is important. Conservation District, you guys still do soil samples. Um, you can get one done for free, as I remember, but then you can also start the discussion about where things are at in the balance of your pasture. So that's an important part of balancing your animals and making sure they're healthy. Mud management is always a Pacific Northwest issue. I think every farmer has animals that are staying in mud. So you have to do things to, to mitigate that. Also something the Conservation District can help you with. Um, llamas and alpacas get foot rot and they get skin issues from the moisture. Um, like any animal, they require care, vet work, and consistent monitoring, and you get what you put into them. So even when it's cold out and you don't really want to go outside, guess who needs to be fed? <laughs> so what can you do with them? Packing. So Roy and I both like to pack. Um, we both raise packers. Um, like I said, they have a different coat type that makes them, because everybody thinks all llamas pack and all alpacas do fiber, and that's not true. <laughs> uh, packers have a dual coat with guard hair. They also have a different build, um, and they're not real common. You're not just going to see locally a packer unless you come to one of our farms. That's not something usually that's floating around on Craigslist. Uh, most llamas pack 70 to 85 pounds depending on your elevation gain, their conditioning, their, their attitude, and where you're going. You know, you head over to Colorado, and some of those places you have elevation gain, and you're up at a higher elevation, so you get a little more winded. You also have to watch for rattlesnakes. Llamas need to be close to age four in order to pack, or you can do damage to them. And depending on where you pack, you might have to bring extra forage for them. Good pack equipment is going to run $400 and up. There's a lot of junk on Craigslist in places where people think they're going to get a $100 pack, and that's like buying REI tennis shoes from 30 years ago. So, and showing all the three of us show. Um, so there's lots of classes for showing. There's the confirmation classes, but there's also like dog agility classes. So did any of you guys see that cute little girl walking around with a llama? She shows that llama, so it's pretty cute. Showing can be used to promote breeding programs and prove that your outside opinion deems your animal to be suitable for breeding. Just because it has testicles or a uterus does not need it should be, mean it should be making more. In order to show, you need halters, stall items, mats, hay bags, transportations, <laughs> grooming supplies. It's never ending. <laughs> 
So, and there's awards for overall for halter, fleece, and performance. So that llama in the picture was won the whole entire show last October. He won halter performance and was the overall champion for the show. All right, so one of the things we all like to do is therapy work. That llama on the left, that's actually the junior high where I work. And the, the second picture from the left is one of the llamas we have here. He, he, he does hospice work. And the middle one is another one of the llamas I've done hospice work and the one on the right um, llamas can, and alpacas, not so much alpacas, some of them will do it, but llamas are, tend to enjoy it more than alpacas. Um, so they go to nursing homes, kids camps, hospice, schools, you name it. And then they're registered through a, a, a nonprofit called Pet Partners, and the most registered llamas are actually in Washington State. We have therapy llamas. <laughs> so, and driving which is the best thing to ever do with a llama. We're a little biased on that. Um, so that's now Ocean Shores, and they have, need to be about, be about three and a half years old. It is cheaper than driving horses. I drive horses as well, um, but llama driving is the ultimate. And good equipment's gonna cost you about $1,300 and up, depending on what you get and where you get it, but the pony carts do not work on llamas. So, and this is 4-H, an FFA, um, well-socialized and appropriate adult llama or alpaca can be used for youth pro projects and there are local and state competitions for both. I was actually the first 4-H and FFA kid in Washington State with llamas. And fiber. So, not all llamas and alpacas have good fiber. Just because it's one of them doesn't mean it does. Um, and you'll hear that Llamas are for packing and alpacas are for fiber. Well, I'm telling you, a lot of those 4-H animals you see out there, they don't have great fiber. That's why the, four, the alpaca breeders gave them to the kids. Um, they also, as they age, the fiber quality changes and it's not as fine once they start aging. Just like women, our hair gets really coarse, same thing, so. And there's no money in fiber, oh my gosh. For what I sell a fleece for, I can maybe pay for two bags of grain and that lasts me maybe a half a month to a month for one or two llamas. So it's just fun, it's a labor of love. So um, that little girl you guys see walking around, this is her <laughs> when she was younger. So and some people have them just because they love them, which is what a lot of people do, and that's fine. Um, you need to know a good cheer, you need to know somebody that can help you take proper care of them, have a good fat. That's where our education day comes in. We give you those tools to be successful. Um, the manure is not hot like horse, chicken, or cattle manure, and it can be placed right into the garden beds. And we compost our manure. We did a, a share with the conservation district, and they helped us build some bunkers and helped us firm up our gutters and our ditches. And so we have farmers that come and pick up all that manure. It leaves our place. So it's not the stuff I use. Um, they're great for small acres, acreage, because they're neat and clean as long as you don't overpopulate them. And mo manure mitigation is something that needs to be managed in order to avoid runoffs into water sources. So, questions? You have the whole group here. If you have a question, we are happy to answer it. Anything to add? I, I do actually have a couple things to add. Um, not all vets can help you with your llamas. So it's really important that you can find a vet that's willing to learn or willing to find another vet that can help you to understand camelids. Because it's not just a cow doctor and a llama are, are not the same thing. And so it's really important to see if you can find a vet that can understand or learn or willing to contact someone. To, uh, to support your animals. Um, the only other thing I was gonna say is, is llama manure is really important in, in the use to be able to use for fertilizing and mitigating, but their fiber, not all fiber can be used in fiber products for just like sheep wool. Not all sheep wool, they don't use the belly of the sheep wool. Same thing with llamas. There's parts of the llama that the fiber is not ever gonna be really good for. So in gardening, 
the fiber can be used to line your flower pots. It can be used in your pathways of your gardens because llama fiber will break down over time, but it does help hold moisture within your flower pots to maintain so you're not having to water it all the time or have it leaking through the bottom and taking all your soil nutrients out of your flower pots or your raised garden beds so you can use that also helps with aerating soil that's really compact so using that fiber within your soil can be a benefit um, it's simply used as uh, insulation for your outdoor cat barns or your cat what we call cat condos at my house to keep them warm as well. So the fiber can be used for multiple things, even if it's not well used or can be used for, for your fiber products. Is there anything else? <laughs> Roy has something about insurance. No. Oh. All right, so uh, I keep on getting questions about guards, so I thought I'd bring that up real quick. Thank you. <laughs> A little bit taller over here. Um, so on guards if you are considering getting a llama as a guard for sheep or goats or something like that uh strongly strongly suggest getting a female because a gelding even a gelded male will still try to breed the smaller livestock uh every once in a while there's a gelded male that won't but it's few and far between and they'll try doing it when you're not looking and a two three hundred pound llama will easily crush a sheep or a goat the other thing is um lifespan of a llama. You're talking 20, 25 years. So it's not something you can just get and be like, oh, I'll keep it around for four or five years. You might be stuck on this for 15, 20 years. So just something to keep in mind. All right? Uh-oh, she's back. <laughs> so another thought on guard llamas is I, I own two guard llamas. Um, they not all llamas are guard llamas. You have to really look out for certain characteristics of their personality to be a guard llama. Uh, the ability, so when I brought my, uh, this is my second set of guard llamas, um, onto my property, the, the, I knew they were gonna be good guards because of what they did the very first time they came on my property. The first thing that they do is they find the highest point of your property and they scan the whole entire property. The second thing that they did is they walked the fence lines. So although we had them quarantined away from our, our herd for a while, uh, 21 days, uh, we then introduced them into our flock of sheep, which is not huge, they're just a little Kadadan flock. And then they went and they walked along every corner, every line of our fence line before they would come back into the center and be with the sheep. They now are so good that I know when my lambs are going, or my sheep are going to be lambing because they start guarding their paddock gates. They lay down in that freezing cold snow, all that ice that happened this last week and so, they were guarding at the gates, laying down outside instead of being in their comfy, cozy, covered area to guard my sheep because they knew they were in lamb. So they're really special. Um, they will babysit the babies while they're napping so the moms can go out and graze, which is really cute. And um, I have very, <laughs> very good guard llamas. And I have a pair of them and I don't have a huge sheep. Uh, the other things guard llamas are really good at is my guard llamas have chased off uh, cougars off my property. Along the fence line, they keep the coyotes out is another big support too. So guard llamas have jobs to do. They're not just there for pasture pets. Anything to add? Go ahead. Hi, I would say this. Um, if you need this. I'm not a uh, llama breeder or an alpaca breeder, but I have both animals and I've had them for a really long time. And I would recommend that if you're new to that industry, you do not get an animal off of Craigslist. Those animals are on Craigslist for a reason. If you're new, to alpacas and llamas, you need to do a lot of research, you need to talk to breeders because you need to know what the breeders know about those animals in order to get your first good healthy animals. Then after a while and you've figured out how it all works and what a healthy animal is supposed to look like and be like, you're probably a little bit more prepared to get the Craigslist animal. But there's a reason the animals are on Craigslist. And a lot of times what you're gonna end up with and what happened to me when I went into it blindly was I ended up with a bunch of vet bills that I didn't understand that I was gonna have 
because I didn't set myself up to get the right animals to begin with. Now that I've had them for a while, I feel more prepared that I could take care of an animal that wasn't as healthy as maybe a beginner animal. But Craigslist, talk to breeders and talk to as many as you can and do as much research as you can and get the best first animals that you possibly can so that um, you don't set yourself up to be paying vet bill after vet bill after vet bill with your first animals and so that you get the animals that do what you want them to do. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. I've been doing this for over 40 years. The most successful people are the people that do the research, set up their place, then get the animals, or decide not to. Here. Okay. Well, it's so happy.